In today's heart-pounding installment discussing the properties of solutions, I'd like to, of course, begin with a hilarious chemistry cat taken from quickmeme.com. In this one, the cat says, I'm not trying to poison you. Now finish your PB and jelly sandwich. <laughs> and this one says, is silicon the same in Spanish? Si. Now, if you didn't get either of those two jokes, you're probably normal. If you did, however, you're probably a student of chemistry. After today's lecture, in which we'll cover sections 4 and 5 of chapter 13, you should be able to do the following. First, calculate the concentration of a solute in solution by percent mass, molarity, and molality. Second, calculate a solute's mole fraction. Third, calculate solution vapor pressures using Routes law. And fourth, calculate solution freezing point changes. Please note that we will skip section 13.6. That's the lineup. Let's get started by first teaching you how to calculate concentration. If we define it in its simplest terms, a solution's concentration is the amount of the solute divided by the amount of solution. That's pretty much it. As it turns out, though, concentration can be written in various ways. For example, this way in which we have the mass of the solute divided by the total mass of solution times 100 is known as the solution's concentration by mass, or mass percentage. Now, separately, if you write your concentration in this way, where you have moles of solute divided by liters of solution, we call that the solution's molarity. And it's just another way of expressing its concentration. And separately, if we write a concentration like this, where it's moles of solute divided by kilograms of solvent, that is known as the solution's molality. So let's take a look at some problems. A solution is prepared by dissolving 22.7 grams of calcium chloride and 375 grams of water. The density of the resulting solution is 1.05 grams per milliliter. The concentration of calcium chloride is blank percent by mass. I'm not going to do this for you, but I will let you try it on your own. But I will post a link here to a separate video in which I do, which you're welcome to watch if you'd like. Here's another problem. The concentration of sodium chloride in aqueous solution is 2.23 molar, that is moles per liter, and that has a density of 1.01 grams per mil. It is blank percent by mass. Once again, not going to do it here, but I'll post a link to a separate video in which I do. Here's an example problem involving molarity. What is the molarity of sodium chloride in, sol in solution? It's 13 percent by mass sodium chloride and has a density of 1.10 grams per milliliter. <gasps> You're welcome to attempt it on your own. Once again, totally going to post a link here to a separate video in which I answer this if you'd like to watch. And here's a separate molarity problem. Calculate the molarity of a 25.4% by mass aqueous solution of phosphoric acid. That takes us to a new subject, that of mole fractions. You see, another way of expressing concentration, which is once again just the amount of a solute divided by the amount of solvent, is by writing the solute's mole fraction which is the moles of a solute divided by the total moles of the solute and the solvent together. Here's an example problem. Calculate the mole fraction of phosphoric acid, 25.4% by mass aqueous solution. I'll post a link here to a separate video in which I answer this question, which you're welcome to watch if you choose. We now move to a different subject, solutions and vapor pressure. When placed in sealed containers like this one, Volatile solvents exert a vapor pressure, and they eventually reach a state of equilibrium like this. I talked about something like this in an earlier video. Now, when a non-volatile, which is a non-evaporating solute, is added, it stabilizes the liquid solvent, which decreases its rate of evaporation like this. Once again, if I've got my sealed solvent in here, it happens to be a volatile solvent. And a volatile solvent is a solvent that evaporates easily. If I add a solute to it, that is not volatile, it stabilizes or kind of adheres the molecules of that solvent together, which decreases their rate of evaporation. I invite you to pause this and take a closer look at this figure right now until you really have your mind wrapped around this concept. So once equilibrium is established, the new vapor pressure is now lower than the old one. We can see that shown in this figure here. Once again, I've got my volatile solvent evaporating and condensing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth in equilibrium. I add a solute that is not volatile. It decreases the rate of back and forth and back and forth until we reach a new equilibrium. Once again, you're welcome to pause the video here and look at this figure closely until you've wrapped your head around the concept. But the question is, why? Why does this happen? Well, as it turns out, solute particles experience an increase in disorder 
or entropy when they dissolve. That's good. As the solvent evaporates, the solute molecules have to cluster back together and become more ordered, which decreases entropy. That's bad. To maximize entropy, then, the solvent molecules remain longer in the liquid state instead of converting to a gas, because it keeps all the molecules separate and hence less ordered. This makes the solvent harder to evaporate. So the entire property that's governing this process is entropy. As a result, then, if you have a volatile solvent and you add a solute to it, that solute decreases its ability to boil. That is, it makes it harder for those solvent molecules to separate from each other and become a gas, and therefore increases the solvent's boiling point. That now brings us to Routes Law. You see, the difference between a solvent's normal vapor pressure, which we can define as being p naught solvent, I really don't know why, but it is, and the solution's vapor pressure, which is p solution, can be summarized using the following equation called Routes Law, where p solution is the vapor pressure of the solution, x solvent is the mole fraction of the solvent, and p naught solvent is the original vapor pressure that the solvent would have if it were pure and didn't have any solute dissolved in it. Let's take a look then at a Routes Law problem. Calculate the vapor pressure of a solution made by dissolving 109 grams of glucose, whose mass is right there, in 920 milliliters of water at 25 degrees Celsius. <gasps> the vapor pressure of pure water happens to be this. Assume the density of the solution is one gram per mil. I'm not gonna answer that for you here, but we'll post a link to a separate video in which I do that you're welcome to check out if you like. I realize that at this point, you're probably dying to know. What about freezing temperatures? In other words, how does adding a solute to something that's frozen increase or decrease or affect the freezing temperature? Well, you should know that adding a non-volatile solute to a solvent also decreases its freezing point. That begs the question then, why? Well, I'll tell you why. The reason is because solutes get down in between solvent molecules that prevents the solvent molecules from being able to cohere or stick to each other and therefore freeze. This happens to be why putting salt on ice causes it to melt. The reason is because ice really is frozen water, which is a bunch of water molecules locked together in a very rigid formation. Salt ions dissolve down in between the water molecules and cause that lockage to break apart, converting it from a solid to a liquid. That's why when you throw salt on ice, it now freezes at a much lower temperature because you have to now decrease the temperature below what the freezing temperature normally would be in order to get those molecules to lock back together and convert back to a solid. This brings us to one other interesting point for which I'm going to take a direct quote from the text. Quote, some physical properties of solutions differ in important ways from those of pure solvents. For example, pure water freezes at zero degrees Celsius but aqueous solutions freeze at lower temperatures. We utilize this behavior when we add ethylene glycol antifreeze to a car's radiator to lower the freezing point of the solution. The added solute, the ethylene glycol, also raises the boiling point of the solution, for reasons that we discussed before, all having to do with entropy, above that of pure water, making it possible to operate the engine at higher temperature, and, may I add, at a broader range of temperatures, both high and low. So the change in a solution's freezing point can be calculated by using the following equation, where delta T sub F is the decrease in the solution's freezing point relative to that of the pure solvent. K sub F is the molal freezing point depression constant, whew, and M is the solution's molality. That brings us to a wonderful problem. Calculate the freezing point of 0 0.08500 molal aqueous solution of glucose. The molal freezing point depression constant of water is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. As per usual, I'm not going to answer this question in this video, but I'll post a link to a separate video in which I do answer the question, which you're welcome to watch if you so choose. To end this video, I'd like to post a link here to a separate video that has nothing to do with the subject whatsoever. I'm just posting here because I think it's freaking hilarious. In this slightly dated video, an old narrator who used to do instructional videos for uh, companies named Bud Haggart wrote and narrated a supposed tutorial for an invention called the turbocabulator. Now I want you guys to please understand the turbocabulator is not a real thing. The purpose of this video that he made was just to help us scientists realize how frequently we err on the side of making 
the words we use sound way more complicated to non-scientists than they need to be. I hope you enjoy the video because it's totally awesome. For a number of years now, work has been proceeding in order to bring perfection to the crudely conceived idea of a transmission that would not only supply inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors, but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing cardinal grammeters. Such an instrument is the turbo encabulator. Now, basically, the only new principle involved is that instead of power being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it is produced by the modial interaction of magneto-reluctance and capacitive directants. The original machine had a base plate of prefamulated amulite surmounted by a malleable logarithmic casing in such a way that the two spurving bearings were in a direct line with a panometric fam. The latter consisted simply of six hydrocoptic marzal veins so fitted to the ambifacient lunar wane shaft that side fumbling was effectively prevented. The main winding was of the normal lotus o delta type placed in panendermic semi-boloid slots of the stator, every seventh conductor being connected by a non-reversible tremi pipe to the differential girdle spring on the up end of the grammys. The turbo encabulator has now reached a high level of development and it's being successfully used in the operation of nofertrunions. Moreover, whenever a fluorescent score motion is required, it may also be employed in conjunction with a drawn reciprocation dingle arm to reduce sinusoidal replenition. It's not cheap, but I'm sure the government will buy it. 